everybody. This is much tall, too tall for me. Anyway, um, thank you so much for coming this evening. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping points. Um, if you could take the time now to turn off or silence your cell phone. Um, and if you don't turn off your phone, then I ask you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, if you haven't already, please take a minute and sign up for our email newsletter. I promise we will not spam you. Um, and you can find out about all the other great events and things we've got going on in the store. Um, also, if you haven't picked up one of our events calendars, we have postcards up here, and I'd love it if you could grab one of those and come back and see us again. Um, so thank you again so much for coming. My name is Sarah Belline, and on behalf of the entire staff, I'm really happy to welcome you. Um, and I'm so pleased to welcome J.D. Dickey tonight for his new book, Empire of Mud, The Secret History of Washington, D.C. Um, Empire of Mud unearths and untangles the roots of our capital story and explores how the city was tainted from the outset, nearly stifled from becoming the proud citadel of republic that George Washington and Pierre L'Enfant envisioned more than two centuries ago. And J.D. and I were just talking about his background, which I think is really fascinating. Uh, he is the author of The Rough Guides to Washington, D.C., um, and uh, Washington, D.C. Directions, um, as well as a contributor to The Rough Guide um, to the Lost Symbol, the Dan Brown, to the Dan Brown book. He's also written for The Independent and The Daily Telegraph and created contents for sites such as Feed, Budget Travel, and Void Magazine. Now, we, if you didn't know, we recently started this events program uh, just over the summer. Um, this is our second season of events. And it's really fun to get to plan an events program, let me tell you, uh, to get to sort of start from scratch and see what kind of books come along and what you want to put on the calendar. Uh, when JD emailed me, I just thought, wow, this is the perfect book for Kramer Books, the perfect book for our events program. Um, so I'm so glad that the night has come and JD is here. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Sarah and Kramer Books and uh, the city of Washington, D.C. Uh, for allowing me to speak about my book. Uh, Washington is actually one of my favorite cities, despite what you may think about the book. I didn't just come here to bury the city, I came here to praise it. And uh, part of that is because I started writing about it about 10 years ago uh, for those travel books that Sarah mentioned. And it's interesting how Empire of Mud had its genesis in those because I found myself finding this research that didn't fit into the conventional categories of what you're supposed to talk about in a travel book. And I started reading about all kinds of dark chapters and disturbing aspects of the city that, I mean, a contemporary tourist isn't going to want to read about that. But I kept the stories and eventually molded them into this book that became Empire of Mud. So in order to discuss a little bit about what the city was like then, I want to take you on a journey a mental journey, if you will, of what it was like to come from Baltimore to Washington, D.C., specifically Washington City, where the capital was, in the 1820s. So imagine, as Thomas Twining describes in Travels in America, that you're in a stagecoach. Now, this isn't a masterpiece theater type of stagecoach. There aren't refined people you know, having tea inside. You're in a suffocating wooden box, pressed cheek to jowl against people you'd rather avoid. There isn't a window for light or air, smells bad, and you're going over some pretty deeply rutted uh, furrows in the ground. But imagine there is a window, and in this box, we are headed toward the capital, which we've heard so much about. It's the proud citadel of the Republic uh, that finally got its independence in 1783 from British after the uh, success of the Treaty of Paris. And there's been much written about this place. So what you would first see are forests and pasture lands spreading out, eventually becoming tobacco farmsteads that are falling into disrepair. In the distance, you might see a few collapsing houses, some abandoned buildings, which actually aren't that old, some foundations that hasn't, haven't been followed up upon, and some shacks and hovels, along with a few plantations in the distance. There's also the Capitol and the White House, beautiful gems of architectural construction, which were praised during their time and even today for being unusually magnificent. And especially then, they were gr the grandest buildings in North America. So you get out of your carriage, and the first thing you will do is fall into mud up until the depths of your knees. It's deep, it's sodden, or it's dusty, depending on the season. 
and you become coated in this muck, this mire of the capital. There's not much to see, really. There are a few buildings that are falling apart. There are some underdeveloped buildings, more of the same. In the distance, there's the Capitol and the White House. But really, it's a rather unimpressive start. The roads, especially Pennsylvania Avenue, are huge, up to 160 feet wide. They're, the mud furrows are deep enough that you cannot cross the roads on foot. It takes a carriage going in various directions to do that. And they're wet. This is the center of a huge drainage basin. So Tiber Creek comes from the north of the city and makes everything wet, and along with the privies, which sometimes overflow and everything else. And alongside is the Washington City Canal, which is intended as a vehicle for commerce and is actually an open sewer. So it only draws three foot feet of water, so it's kind of nasty as well. So this is the center of the capital, kind of unimpressive. And to add to the allure, there's cows and pigs wandering in the streets, as well as disease outbreaks of things like malaria and yellow fever that are usually more prone to affect countries around the equator than something that's the capital of the United States of America. Along with all this, industry is lacking, commerce, anything outside of government employment. So how did we get here? How is it that within 30 years this great city emerged still stillborn? What Pierre L'Enfant called a mere contemptible hamlet after his design was never realized. Well, part of it is in the genesis of the city itself and the reason it existed in the first place. And in 1783, as mentioned, right before the Treaty of Paris was signed, there was a rebellion of troops of the Pennsylvania militia against the Philadelphia State House. And that resulted in the removal of Congress from the same building where the Congress of the Confederation was holding court to another place. Alexander Hamilton, famous later as Secretary of the Treasury, converted this episode into a threat of the federal government and the dangers of the mob and mutiny and demanded that if a federal capital was to be created, that the, go the government, the Congress, must have exclusive authority on its turf, which basically meant that the people would be subject to Congress and couldn't vote, things like that. And so this was realized in the Constitution, which gives Congress exclusive authority for this matter. Now in 1790, the Residence Act is passed and that gives the president the right to uh, locate the city and he did so 11 miles upstream from his plantation at Mount Vernon. And the next year in 1791, Pierre Charles L'Enfant presents his famous survey map of the city. Now a lot of us have seen that and it's, it's Baroque grandeur to be sure. I mean the roads are laid out in a radial fashion similar to uh, Imperial France. And at the same time, there are plans for parks and fountains and gardens and everything else, everything you could imagine that a modern, lovely city would have. But this is never realized, ultimately, for reasons that will be described, but it creates a pretty good effect. As a symbol of what's to come, L'Enfant is fired not soon after he presents his map, so he got on the wrong people's nerves and he had to go. But his map is followed up upon by Andrew Ellicott, 1792, and then from 1800 to 1802, the city moves in, becomes the capital of the United States, and Congress, in the Organic Act of 1801, organizes the constituent parts of the city, of the district. And over the next year, including that, it will be five components. The District of Columbia, the Diamond on the Potomac, which is 100 square miles, huge for a city of any kind. Uh, the capital, which is Washington City, which is basically everything south of Florida Avenue and on the shoreline of the Potomac and the Anacostia Rivers, known then as the Eastern Branch. Beyond that, in what was formerly Maryland, Washington County and Georgetown. And then on the Virginia side of the river, the old city of Alexandria and Alexandria County. So this is the city that they have created. Now there is local government. The locals cannot vote for their national leaders, but they can vote for local ones. City council at first and later, later the mayor. But the problem is when the city actually starts developing, it turns out that there are a few stipulations that aren't exactly friendly to local government. One is that taxation, which helps make a local government run, does not apply to federal property, which is the only kind worth anything. So they have to tax everything else which is a pretty tough burden if you're a small merchant or a struggling homeowner or anything like that. Because eventually, because of the lack of funding, the local government